So we're looking ahead to the uh, weekend's action. We've got uh, four pretty interesting games. Kildare against Tyrone throws in at five. That's on a new bridge. Westmead Clare, six o'clock. Lee Shoffley is at seven. And then Mayo Armagh on the TV against Armagh. Uh, should be a really uh, cracking game. We have Billy Joe Padden with us. We figured you were a good man to talk to about Mayo Armagh. How are you doing? Very good, Joe. Very good. The uh, transfer you made to Armagh, I mean, we'll get on to the game in a moment, but back um, back end of 2010 into 2011, from memory, it doesn't. Say, I don't remember it being a massively contentious or uh, scandalising kind of thing. People pretty much thought, OK, fair enough, there are genuine reasons, and it was as, as kind of straightforward as these things can be. Was that the situation in the two counties as well? It definitely was. It was never really my intention to go and play for Armagh. I was just transferring from my club, Belmullet. I was living up in Newry and transferring to Carrick and My only intention at the time was to play club football. And I was just lucky enough that Paddy O'Rourke was the manager of Armagh at the time. And late that winter, he had asked me, would I be interested in going in? And I was in good physical condition. I wasn't injured or had, wasn't, I hadn't any issues. And I thought... It'd be a good opportunity, if nothing else, to get to know some people around the GA scene in Armagh. And I, I felt I had a little bit left in the tank. And um, it was a really good decision on my part. I enjoyed every single minute of it. And uh, it was a really positive thing for me. And I never got any backlash on either side. Armagh people welcomed me with open arms. And every single Mayo person I ever spoke about to totally understood where I was coming from in terms mm -hmm. of the distances that I was travelling back to Balmullet or not. And then as it happened, that uh, Mayo dramatically improved once I, once I left. So that's <laughs> yeah. it. That's, 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 that's. The Billy Joe departure bounce kicked in and all was well in Mayo football. I suppose yeah. as well, you were 29 years of age at that stage, you'd given a fair degree of service. And it wasn't the equivalent of going from a lesser county to a big county. Therefore, people understood the reasons were, as you said, genuine. Yeah, it's just a pure proximity case, yeah. and it just—it was just an opportunity for me to play intercounty football and not having to be dealing with all that, with all the travelling that was it was involved going back to Mayo. And to be honest, I had always looked, admired Ulster football, and you, you, as any person would, or you like to challenge yourself in a different environment mm. and, and see how you react. And uh, it was a really good experience for me in that regard as well. Because you were 29 and therefore your, uh, both your potential and the, you know, the limits of your ability and the extent of your ability pretty well established at that stage in your career, I, I may be conflating two different things here, but the question I was going to ask was, was there less pressure on you being Willie Joe Padden's son in Armagh as opposed to Mayo? I think so, but I never really felt that there was a whole lot of pressure on me in Mayo from the point of view that I, I didn't think I was ever going to come close to the standards he set. And throughout most of my career, I was happy just trying to fulfill whatever role I could for whatever Mayo manager or whatever team I was asked to do and, and do it the best I could. Mm. And it, it, I, I never really felt that it bogged me down in any way. But you're right, going to Armagh, you, didn't ha you don't have any of that history really in terms of what you've done at underage football or what you've done in previous games. And with the distance, you're, you wouldn't have played Armagh that often. So lots of Armagh people or supporters, I presume, didn't know much about me as a footballer. So mm. it was kind of having to prove yourself all over again. And that was something I actually looked forward to. And um, I, I think that really, particularly in that league campaign in my first year with Armagh, I, I got a lot of positive feedback in relation to the way I was playing. Right. And, and that, was, that, was, that was enjoyable, to be honest. I always think it's amazing that there are so many different footballing cultures on, you know, across these 32 tiny pockets on this very tiny island. So you've had uh, that rare experience of inter-county level in two different counties and a sense of different cultures, you know, and, and what skills are prized and emphasised in, in different um, areas of the country. So uh, just in, you know, in, in that regard, was it playing your football for Mayo and Armagh in terms of how you go about your business, the things that were emphasised you might talk to us about the differences, or were there any? There were definitely differences. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think it's one of the the first things I noticed. Um, you know, we I had in my perception of Armagh, and it was it was accurate that that team that they had that won the All Ireland, they were you know probably ahead of the curve in terms of physicality. Yeah, they were very physically strong, and I, I think that by the time I got to Armagh. Maybe lots of the other counties had caught up with our man in terms of that that conditioning, and, and I always remember one of the established players. You know, one of the first nights we were in the gym together, uh, one of the established players. Oh, I kind of knew what I was doing. And he says, "Oh, you, you must have lifted a lot of weights down in Mayo too." And he says, "Yeah, we did. You know, it's very similar what you're doing in that regard." Mm. For me, it's more interesting about how 
different the priorities were in terms of how you played the game. Mm. And I, I always, walking straight in the door in Armagh, you always got the sense that they prioritised people that could score, people that were going to play in the full forward line. And you looked at Stephen McDonald still playing on that team. Jamie Clark was just coming into that team. And you could see that even though the number of possessions a player might get in that area of the field was down, you could have a greater impact playing in that area. area. And you only have to look at, when they won their All-Ireland, all how Ronan Clark, Steve McDonald, uh, O'Sheen, McConville, all those players, Jeremy Marsden, contributed on the scoreboard. Mm. And I think it's, it's at odds with maybe what is going on in the culture of Mayo football. And this is something that's gone on for years and years and something that I feel quite strongly about that, in Mayo, the culture maybe might be to have a, a player that's handling loads of ball out around the middle of the field. You yeah. think about our halfbacks running up the field, Lee Keegan. And I just think that as coaches and mentors in Mayo, we don't value the, the player with the high skill level and we don't show enough patience with those young players to say that you, as a skillful player, will have most impact on the game playing at 15 or 14 and you have to learn that position mm. first and foremost and even if you look at some of the great forwards that Mayo have produced and people say we don't they don't produce enough like Andy Morn played games for Mayo at wing back and now when you think of that now it seems ridiculous mm. because he was footballer of the year at full forward or corner forward he should have played every minute of his football career in that position because he was so effective even players like Kieran McDonald played a lot of football out the field maybe he would have been even more effective playing closer to goal and I think that that's a change in mindset that Mayo football needs to adapt and Armagh probably has that and it's kind of when you see the two sides married maybe Armagh don't have the emphasis on that sort of athleticism in the middle third that Mayo have mm. and each county can learn something off the other and that's always what I took away from my experiences in both counties. Yeah that's fascinating I guess the really fascinating and trickier thing to try and establish is the origin of those attitudes I mean People talk about the Donegal shorthand passing game and there are theories that the winter and the wind coming in from the Atlantic meant the kicking wasn't so easy so the best way to keep possession was to uh, pass the ball, uh, fist pass short. But then you kind of think about that and, well, why are Kerry the best kickers in the game? You know, <laughs> if, if the logic held for Donegal and the Atlantic weather coming in, there's plenty of Kerry pitches right on the Atlantic with the gales <laughs> howling in. So really some team in the Midlands should be the best at, at kicking. So it's very difficult to actually figure out the origin of these things. I don't know, in Mayo, there's such an honesty out there. Maybe there's something a bit flash about the selfish type who doesn't do the hard running, but is happy to take the cream at the end. I think you're probably right. I, I think that there's another element too. I think that Mayo supporters in general are traditionalists in the way they want the game to be played. And I think if you even look at the dad, the way yeah, he I was, I was just going to say, I mean, your dad soaring in the air did no one any favours. Yeah, and <laughs> like there was even that those teams he played on, you had TJ Tagal and Lee McHale, people that were, they were all midfielders, effectively, all wanted to go and catch kickouts. Yeah, and Mayo just seemed to value players that want to play in that position, and that's mm. why you've turned so many, you know, forwards have been turned into half backs because they're always in and around the ball. And I even found out myself. I, as my first experience of adult football and club football was playing corner forward. But as you got bigger and stronger, you got moved further and further out the field. Whereas sometimes I think, would you, would for my club and you know, my, for my own career, would I have been better off staying playing at full forward? Would mm. I have had a, a more impactful career? Mm. And that's something that I think that the culture in Mayo football, they have to start thinking around those things and will maybe help you to produce more quality forwards because there's no doubt the hardest position for me to play is in the full forward line because mm. it's all about timing, understanding where the ball is going to come from, where your marker is going to be uh, ha and then having the skill level to execute the, the, the shot with left or right or whatever you have to do. And if you can learn to play in there, I think it's easier to adapt to going out and playing number 10 or out to play midfield if you're big and strong enough. Whereas if you, all your schooling and all your coaching has happened in midfield or in the half back line, it's very hard to go in and learn those scoring instincts that mm. many of the great forwards have. Uh, to throw another point at you and then we'll get on to the game at the weekend. Uh, accepting what you're saying about a gym culture being fairly similar in Armagh and Mayo and Mayo had caught up on that 0-2 winning team and it was, it was yeah. fairly common practice at that point. What about levels of aggression? I wonder were they uh, discernibly uh, different because the perception would be in Armagh um, we, for cultural reasons as much as anything, like what the GAA means to people in that part of the world is primal um, and you're representing something more than just the jersey, you know, it is, it, it, it's just its place and history in that part of the world. But then I had the contradicting thought that you, like, you think across McGlenn with like the barracks at the pitch 
like they should be the team of all teams that want to break your legs and smash you and like you know go through a door to beat you but then they're the silkiest most beautiful footballers around uh, and there's more contradictions there so I'm throwing all that at you and, and seeing what, what comes back well I've gone to Cross McGlynn and it, <laughs> they can hit you they can hit you too, too well. okay <laughs> fair point but, that, but I guess there must be an emphasis on skill too and there definitely is there I guess is, the, is sort of the point no. No doubt, and I don't think it was ever, it's ever a case where Armagh football, um, I suppose, f- sidetracked skill level in, in favour of aggression mm. or physicality. Mm. Uh, but you're right, uh, I did notice, particularly in club football, a, a real difference in terms of the physicality, uh, particularly particularly on away games. You'd go away to Cross Lane, you'd go away to Cullihanna or Mahri or places where it's a real sort of intimidating atmosphere. Like, nothing... Uh, nothing dirty, but you they hit you with everything they could and it's hard and everything's in your face. And until you're able to prove that you can stand up to that, you get that on every single visit you take to those club grounds because they do create a hostile atmosphere and they do pre- protect their home ground like any good home team should. Mm. Uh, and you're, you're right, though. Even my first couple of training sessions with Armagh were more physical than maybe with Mayo. And maybe that's because I was a new player coming in and they probably had perceptions that Mayo players aren't able to take that physical stuff mm. and they wanted to see whether I was as an individual able to take it uh, I remember Ke- having come some good battles with Kieran McKeever in the early stages <laughs> of, of training sessions and but once they realize that you're you're able to take it that you'll take your the hits and you'll get up and you'll you'll keep going uh, it's all accepted and you, you just you just move on but I think there is an aggression there but at the same time it's right what you say about the likes of, of Cross McGlynn. They want to play fast football with high skill level, but when they don't have the ball, they want to win it back as quickly as possible. Mm. And that, for the most part, is the ethos throughout football in our map. Mm. Well, I guess we're talking generally here, and there's going to be tons of exceptions, but it's just interesting to get your experience because not too many have made that transfer. As for the game on Saturday in Castle Bar, just how dodgy is Mayo's home form? I, you know, you keep reading. Well, it's not great when it's um, examined. How how not great is it? Well, I'm not the greatest man for stats, but it, it's not very good at all. And I think if you went back through the, the league campaign, they've definitely lost uh, the last number of years. They've lost as many as they've won there. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that many of their performances in Championship, the Roscommon game, including recently the Galway game last year in McHale Park, have been quite poor. And you can go back to a number of defeats in, in McHale Park. I think it's no surprise that this Mayo team is built, and I know people probably scoff at this, but it's built to play in Crow Park. Mm. And they've won many games in Crow Park. Okay, we all accept they haven't won the big one. But they've played a lot of good games in Crow Park. When you look yeah, at well, by, by the definition, team, the fact that they've been to so many finals means they've won most of their games in Crow Park. Yeah. And they, they, they enjoy the fast surface, they enjoy the wide open spaces, and it suits Lee Keegan, yeah. Paddy Dirk, and these sort of athletes that can get, get all over the field. You just don't have that space in McHale Park. The surface, the grass is much thicker, the ball doesn't travel as fast, it's mm. a short, much shorter pitch. Now, there's not, that's all there is. It's just to do with the pitch. They prefer a bigger pitch. The support Mayo get, oh, has always got in, in the league and in the championship has been incredible. It's just it's a pure footballing reason that I think that Mayo haven't been able to perform at their best in McHale Park. Now, there is an added element to it that they don't haven't played that many games later in the season in McHale Park. And over the last number of years, Mayo have got better, apart from last year, have got better as the season has gone on mm. and their performance level has improved towards the, an All-Ireland quarterfinal or semi-final stage, whatever stage it may be. Um, so this is a real opportunity for Mayo and I think it's a final straw for many of the players in terms of the perception of their home form because they probably shouldn't have lost the Roscommon game in that they had enough possession to win the game. It was down to bad free-taking and bad decision-making that probably cost them against the Roscommon team that played very well. And they'll see the, the players will see this as an opportunity to give something back to the supporters uh, to repay them for much of the great support that they've got over the years. But at the same time, they want to progress mm. and they want to put that sort of talk about poor home form to bed for at least a little while longer if they're good enough to progress to the Super 8. Uh, Armagh are in their fifth year under McGee. They certainly seem like they're at their most accomplished and they are now the great entertainers. And I haven't seen them a few times this year. They've been involved in these brilliant epic games. They have a goal threat as well. They have some brilliant forwards. How big a threat are they to Mayo, Billy Joe? Huge threat because, uh, you said it, they've got some brilliant forwards. You know, Reno O'Neill has superb talent we all know what Jamie Clark and, and Stephen Campbell can do I think one thing that they've added 
and it's been hugely important for them in the last number of games is that you know you have Jamar Hall and Aidan Nugent who are really skillful footballers both players that can use left and right yeah. they're working really hard for our map but if a scoring opportunity comes for those players or a pass needs to be picked out they have the skill level to execute it and then add to the fact that you have Niall Grimley he'll be in there around midfield you'll have a Jarley O'Burns who'll be in their midfield and they're also exceptional footballers real good kickers can score points and you're looking at a team that's strength is totally in the front end of the field mm. as opposed to many Gaelic, team, Gaelic teams we see now where their strength may be in the defensive setup they have. And I, I think that's why they've got big scores, but that's also why they're probably vulnerable at the back. Are they? Okay. What about those matchups? Who's going to take some of those uh, more marquee forwards from a male point of view? Well, I, I think that Brendan Harrison has, pro- has proven that he can do a good job in the full back line. So I think he'll have, his job will be if Reen O'Neill is in the full forward position, he'll pick him up. If Mer- Andrew Mernon goes in full forward, he'll pick him up. I think somebody like Chris Barrett may get the job on Jamie Clark, and that'll be very interesting to see. Chris has shown that it's a, a very aggressive cornerback. Um, and that might leave, uh, maybe Keith Higgins might follow Stephen Campbell because Stephen Campbell has shown that he's come out the field in a lot of games. And we know how dangerous... Keith has been on a, in the attacking half of the field and he'd probably be more comfortable a, a, away from goals at this stage. Um, so I think that's important. But they always have the option of putting Lee Keegan back on Rhian O'Neill mm. or putting Paddy Durkin back on, on Jamie Clark because even though they're more comfortable in the half-back line, they, those two players in particular have shown that they have the defensive ability to go back and do man-marking jobs if required. In terms of what you want to see from Mayo then, from their perspective, I saw you make a point in your Mayo News column that you thought against Dan, they were at their best when they had a degree of patience, when they didn't seem to be consumed with this uh, determination to get like a killer score. Um, And that's always uh, an aspect of Mayo's play at times. They're much better when they look composed and and calm. And you just don't want this, from their point of view, either to become another epic. Like, can they Rolls Royce this performance and see this one out and close out the game comfortably? I think you're right. And if it turns into this end-to-end game, I think that will suit maybe the younger team and suit Armagh with the forwards that they have in a, in a real open sort of shootout. I think that it was very interesting for me as I was watching the, the Mayo down game from the stand in among a, a load of Mayo supporters. And that patient build-up play frustrates them a lot. Mm. Even though in, during that game, I, I, I felt it was they were most successful when they were moving it from side to side because down, as most teams have, will have loads of bodies behind the ball. And unless you can create that initial breakthrough, you're going to have to move it left and right to create those op- opportunities. And when Mayo did that in the first half, they created a couple of scores for Fionn McDonough. They won a couple of frees that uh, Conor Loftus was able to knock over. And I, I think it's something that Mayo have to add to their game because they've been, you know, with their halfbacks pushed high up the field, if you're turning over the ball quickly, you're really, really vulnerable. Mm. And they were vulnerable in the Roscommon game to counterattacks like that. They were actually vulnerable in the down game to a couple of counterattacks like that. And I know they'll really want to guard against that. So it's really important for the experienced players in that area, Aidan O'Shea, Lee Keegan, uh, Jason Doherty, if that they don't try and force the issue. There's nothing wrong with, you know, six, seven, eight passes to try and create something if the Armagh defence is back with 12 and 13 bodies behind the ball. Mm. You don't, you don't, you shouldn't feel under pressure to create that scoring opportunity right away. Are you, are you seeing Mayo coming out on top here? I presume you are. I think, I think Mayo will win a very, very close game and, and I, I think the reason they will, they will win is because I expect the, the defense defenders and in some of the matchups I already described yeah. to be able to break even with those talented Armagh forwards. And if Aidan O'Shea continues the good form, he should be able to give Mayo a platform, even though you know the loss of Jim O'Connor is going to be a huge blow for Mayo on Saturday and, yeah. and in any game, any game in the future. And I just expect that some of the guile that Andy Moran has, that maybe Conor Loftus can show again, have another good game. And I expect Killian O'Connor to play quite a significant amount of the game, mm. that Mayo will be able to get enough scores against an inexperienced uh, Armagh backline to maybe get, win the game. A very very close one or two point game, and I wouldn't be wouldn't be one bit surprised if Armagh were to win it, and if Armagh were to get goals, I think it'd be very difficult for Mayo to peg them back because Mayo haven't really looked like scoring goals in, in many of their recent games. Mm. Before you go, Michael Quinn Living was an OTBAM this morning, and they asked him to pick his five favourite forwards in the game at the moment, and in no particular order, he went for Connor Cox, Jamie Brennan. Paul Mannion, David Clifford, and as you'll hear here, and it is of a relevance to uh, Saturday, Reen O'Neill. He can do everything. Everything. We went up to Armagh in the league. No, I wasn't playing. I went to the, went to the game. He's big, 
very good overhead, left and right leg. But the, the biggest thing I was actually impressed with him is a lot of the time with inside forwards, especially when you break onto the scene, you're very quick to take the shot. You're very conscious that the players you're marking are better and you might get blocked down. So, you know, you'll get the ball and you might quick it, hit it a little bit too quick. He's ne he never seems like he's under pressure. He's always just, he'll take his step and then he's kicking it over. We watched, we obviously, when we were playing down, we watched a video of the down in Armagh game and he was incredible in that as well. Um, he has a huge future ahead of him. Huge future. I think he's, he's if you were, like, if you were giving out a young player of the year, he'd be the one I'd look at because I think he's, he's really, he's really, really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very, been very, very impressed with him. He's, he's obviously been healthy. He's a couple of very good forwards beside him as well. Like Jamie Clark has been brilliant for the last number of years. Um, and when you're getting the ball delivered that, they, that he's putting in, it's very easy to do that. But yeah, he has, he's a bit of ingenuity, but he's also not afraid to take on the shot. Um, I think he's, yeah, he's, he's, he, he'll really come good in the next few years. And to be honest, I think Armagh have a, have a crop of young guys who are 21, 22, who are... I, I, they're gonna. They're starting to push their senior lads um, a lot. I, I, I met Jamie a few weeks ago, and he was saying the same. He was like, you know, they've come in and just been a huge breath of fresh air. I think they're going to give Mayo a huge game. Yeah, Michael Quinn living there on OTBAM with thanks to Avant Card, powered by Mastercard. He has two nineteen in his four championship matches so far. Two of six. 2-6 uh, of that from play. He's still only 19 years of age. He's a pretty frightening prospect. Uh, give us your top three in no particular order. He's, he sure is, but I'm going to go for the tried and trusted, and I think uh, Michael has made one massive oversight. I, I, I think that while it's all ahead of Connor Cox and Rian O'Neill and Jamie Brennan, and I expect them to do very, very big things, I'm going to overlook them at the minute and go for Paul Mannion because of what he's he's done for Dublin, and he's still a seriously dangerous prospect in Crow Park. Mm. I also think that David Clifford is just, he's a generational type talent and he's, the things that he's going to do, has done so far and will continue to do are exceptional. But if we're asking of one player that you just would want in the last minute of a game, a point down, it has to be Michael Murphy. He's one of the greatest of all time and I know he plays out the field. I was going to say, are we talking like, midfielders here or are we talking forwards? What are we no, talking? If you had him five minutes to go in a game, point down, who do you want? You want Michael Murphy because he can do anything. He can win a ball on the edge of the square. He can kick a 45. He can lamp one over from 55 yards. Mm. He can create something. He's the man I'd want when the chips are really down. That's an interesting way of framing it. Very interesting way because I hadn't looked at it in those terms. Like he only scored a point the last day out for Donegal. So could Michael Murphy be scoring more? Of course he could. But I think that what you see from Michael Murphy is this uber leadership where he he does whatever needed for his for his team and mm. if he was totally out there looking at stats he would want demand that he plays full forward and he'd come away with five or six or seven points every game but he understands and that's why he's the, the greatest leader in the game at the minute he understands that Donegal can be more successful with him out the field taking all this attention maybe from maybe two or three defenders and that leaves space for Jamie Brennan and Paddy McBurty yeah, and true. that's another reason why he, he if you're building if you wanted to build your team around any player, you know, it's a 22-year-old Michael Murphy, you want to do it. And when you consider that, the stat I heard today is that Donegal have 10 Ulsters in mm. their history mm. and he's led them to five of them. Yeah. And who knows what he'll do. He might get a couple more for them and, and in All-Ireland. So he's exceptional and I still would take him above any of the others in that situation with five minutes to go needing a point. Okay, good answer. Billy Joe, thanks, Mel. No problem, Joe.